Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Following is a presentation of the American Meteorological Society. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the joint uh, session of the 19th Symposium on Climate Variability of Change and the Symposium on Connections Between Mesoscale Processes and Climate Variability. This is the Bernard Harwitz Lecture. The lecture is selected in recognition of significant contributions in the understanding of atmospheric and oceanic fluid dynamics, circulation of the middle atmosphere, or climate dynamics. It's anticipated that the lecture will be published in the bulletin. And we are very privileged today to have as our speaker Carrie Emanuel. Carrie's been a professor at MIT for quite a while. Uh, had, he got his memorial 25th anniversary chair last year. Um, Carrie has published over 120 papers in the refereed literature, supervised over 30 graduate students, um, and has uh, had a distinguished career in, in a wide variety of fields. Uh, what you may not know about one of Carrie's perhaps less noted papers is he's actually had one of the great titles of a, of a manuscript, The Power of a Hurricane. The, the, the Curse of Reckless Driving on the Information Superhighway, uh, <laughs> published in Weather in, 19, in 1998. Uh, and Carrie's in the, a professor at the, in the Department of Earth, and Atmos Earth, Atmosphere, and Planetary Sciences at MIT, which he regrets they could have chosen a better acronym if they would have thought about it a little bit longer. Uh, and this week, Carrie, earlier in his career, received the Meisinger Award from AMS. And this week, if you look at your uh, awards booklet, this looks like it's the Carrie Emanuel Picture Show. Uh, Carrie also received the Carl Gustav Rossby Award and the Lewis Batten Authors Award for his book, Divine Win. And without further ado, Carrie Emanuel. Thank you very much for that uh, very generous introduction. I'll try not to let you down. Um, I'm going to be talking today about, uh, I think, appropriate to the whole theme of, of many of the symposia going on at this meeting, the connection between hurricanes and climate. And the general theme of this talk um, is going to go a little bit out on a limb, but uh, not one that hasn't been explored before. Uh, tropical cyclones may be key players in the global climate system. You know, we're used to thinking of these storms as kind of freaks of nature. They're, they're regarded as being relatively rare. I'll get to that point in a minute. Um, and they're not, until recently, uh, with some interesting exceptions in history, haven't been regarded as themselves critical for certain aspects of climate. So the key points that I'd like to cover today are um, broken down into this list. Uh, tropical cyclones are sensitive to the climate state. I think there's widespread agreement about that, even though there's disagreement about the particulars of it. They are sensitive to climate change, natural and otherwise. Um, Storm-induced mixing of the upper tropical ocean may help drive the thermohaline circulation. This is a relatively new idea, and it seems somewhat radical and non-intuitive, but I hope to explain to you why uh, that uh, seems to be becoming a more uh, interesting idea with time. Um, but taken together, if you take points one and two together, it implies that tropical cyclones actually act in a funny way, partially as a kind of, of thermostat, not for the globe, but for the tropics. Uh, but at the same time, they uh, may act to destabilize climates at higher latitudes. So I'm going to begin with an overview of the sensitivity of tropical cyclones to climate, the first part of this issue, and one which has been discussed very extensively over the last few years, and which I actually also addressed in my talk on uh, Monday, and several other uh, people have talked about this as well. Um, just 
uh, by way of an overview, this is a, a map that uh, has been shamelessly lifted from the Wikipedia, showing the tracks of tropical cyclones over a 21-year period. And uh, there are about 90 of these storms per year globally, with a standard deviation of 10 or so. And when you look at a map like that, um, the notion that these storms are rare takes on a somewhat different and shadier meaning. Uh, they're not that rare globally. Um, of course, a lot of press and even scientific attention is focused on the 12% of these storms or so that occur in the Atlantic, but it's very important to remember that these are global phenomena. And in fact, most of these storms occur in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, not in the Atlantic. Um, I like to use this particular metric of tropical cyclones. It's easy to count them. And in fact, it's much more robust measurement going back in time to count storms. It's much easier to say there was a storm or there wasn't a storm than to talk about measures of intensity, which uh, to do a really good job on that, you actually have to fly uh, uh, aircraft into these storms or be lucky enough to have it pass over a ship or a ground station that survives the experience. Nevertheless, as far as we're concerned, and more importantly, as far as nature is concerned, the number of storms may not be important at all. Uh, for the simple reason that um, you know, really can't compare a, a tropical storm strength system to a Category 5 hurricane in its effects upon nature, its heat flux, mixing of the upper ocean, and so on. Um, and an analogy might be earthquakes, where, of course, there's a whole spectrum of earthquakes, but the amount of energy released collectively by numerous small quakes uh, doesn't come up to the amount released by a few very large ones. So we actually have to be concerned uh, with a metric that gets away from simple counts in many cases. Now, I don't want to get to belabor this point at length because it's worth an entire symposium on itself. Uh, there are a lot of very thorny data issues when you try to reconstruct a history of this and many other metrics from the tropical cyclone database. And what I'm showing you here is an attempt to look at the power dissipation in the northwest part of the Pacific Ocean which is one of two basins which had extensive aircraft reconnaissance. In this case, it ended in 1987. And what you see in, uh, in blue, let's start with that blue curve, is the power dissipation, which is an integral over the lifetime of the storm of the wind speed cubed. And it's a measure of how much kinetic energy is dissipated in the hurricane boundary layer. And therefore, it's a measure of how much energy has been generated or turned into kinetic energy over the lifetime of the storm. And this has in turn been accumulated over all the storms in a given year. And uh, the blue curve comes from the Joint Typhoon Weather Center, and there have been certain adjustments that have been made to the velocities in that data set. Um, going back to 1949, this has been smoothed with a high-frequency filter to take out the interannual type timescale fluctuations, and you see that there are these ups and downs, sort of a net upward trend, but with all kinds of other things going on in that time. The green curve is exactly the same thing, but it's from the Japanese Meteorological Agency with no adjustments to that data that's taken directly from the pressure data. And the red curve is a very recent uh, reanalysis of the satellite era uh, data by Jim Cawson and his group, um, showing some rather big differences in certain uh, intervals of time. There is no net trend in any of this over the last 25 years or so. Uh, the black curve finally is a scaled uh, rendition of the ocean temperature in a part of the tropical western Pacific where these storms typically form. And, um, you know, we can dispute what's going on there. There's an awful lot going on. There are many, many influences on tropical cyclone activity. There does seem to be an upward trend, but I wouldn't want to, to say a, very, uh, uh, a lot about that. In the Atlantic, where we have somewhat more robust measurements uh, over a period of time, this is the same thing. You're looking at the North Atlantic power dissipation, all the essentially a measure of the, the energy generated by hurricanes over their lifetimes, going back to about 1970, but smoothed again with a high-frequency filter. And in green is the uh, ocean temperature between the months of August and October in the part of the tropical Atlantic where the hurricanes form, so-called main development region, and they're amazingly well correlated with a 90% of the variance of the power dissipation quote-unquote, explained by the sea surface temperature, you do not very often encounter such robust and spectacular correlations between completely independent 
quantities in natural time series. So that uh, is something that caught all of our attention. Now, if you take that, um, that, essentially that curve fit and project it back in time, that's what I've done here with a slightly different metric of power dissipation, um, this is going all the way back to the end of the 18th century. So the green curve is the taking that curve fit from what I just showed you and extending it back in time. The sea surface temperature measurements are fairly robust even back to the 19th century, we think, at least on these time scales. However, the blue curve is, again, directly from the HERDAT, and we have absolutely no reason to believe that that's any good before. While some people say 1944, I would say maybe 1958 is more realistic, uh, that we don't have very good measurements of velocity before that. Even so, uh, there seems to be a, a suggestive correlation going back in time. <clears throat> again, one can and has, people have raised a lot of questions about the data set. But particularly in the modern era, it's a very interesting uh, and suggestive uh, correlation. Now, can we go back further in time? And there is this budding field uh, called paleotempestology, which looks for signatures of tropical cyclones uh, in the geological record. And this is pioneered by Cambu Liu at Louisiana State and has been taken up by quite a few other people. The general idea, there are actually several techniques, but I'll describe to you one, and there will be a talk later today, I believe, by Phil Lane that will go into this in much greater depth. Uh, but there are many places, for example, along the Gulf Coast, where you have a marsh, perhaps a lagoon, separated from the Gulf of Mexico, maybe by a, a beach. And um, generally speaking, what happens is that uh, you have a slow deposition of organic material in the marsh and the lagoon. And once in a while, a big storm comes in from the ocean, and uh, the storm surge carries sand into this region. And then, of course, that sand layer is subsequently buried by the organic deposition. So if you go into this region and take a core, you see mud, but in, interspersed with sand layers. And you can radiocarbon date that organic material and discover when the sand layers were brought down. You can see a very nice correlation during the historical hurricane record between the dates of these sand layers and the known occurrence of big storms. So here is an application from my part of the world. Uh, this is Fairhaven, Massachusetts. This is work done by Jeff Donnelly and uh, John Woodruff and, um, and associates at uh, Woods Hole. And uh, this is what this particular area looks like. And here is a core. In this case, what you're actually looking at is the grain size of the particles in the core. So you get very coarse grains uh, that's supposed to denote sand or other material that's been blown in. And you can see a lot of activity here since essentially the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in this upper part of the uh, uh, core. And then you can see some other spikes going back um, 475 calendar years before present and so on. So you get a record in this particular location of storms. One has to be particularly careful here because, of course, in this part of the world we get violent storms sometimes that are not hurricanes. This is sort of a, this is another location out in Long Island where they've done several cores. And one of the interesting things that's emerging from the New England record is a period between about 900 years ago and, the, uh, and roughly the middle of the 17th century when there were no, apparently no storms at all in this stretch of the coastline. You have big regions here where you can't find these sand layers. And this is a, an attempt to synthesize the cores that have been taken all around the North Atlantic as far south as Puerto Rico. Here's a core from Puerto Rico. And uh, there are some patterns beginning to emerge from the collection of these cores, particularly this very quiet period. And so I think as that work continues, we're really going to start to get a feeling for how uh, North Atlantic hurricanes and potentially hurricanes in other parts of the world have varied uh, through time and be able to relate that to other um, climate signals that have been obtained from other proxy records. That's very promising. Let's we'll talk a little bit about the physics. What actually controls the variability of, of tropical cyclones, particularly this metric I've been talking about, power dissipation? We think, and um, it's not been decided, but through history there's been a lot of work on this uh, in other contexts, that the three primary factors are a quantity called the potential intensity, which is a thermodynamic bound on how intense hurricanes can get, and I'll talk about that in a second. The shear of the environmental wind is known to be very important uh, influence on hurricanes, their frequency, their intensity, and so on. 
and low level vorticity in the environment is clearly important as well. The thermodynamic bound uh, comes from the realization that these are simple heat engines that take energy out of the ocean and convert it into mechanical energy. And um, without belaboring the point, the, the closed cycle around a, this is sort of a, a sketch of a, a cartoon of a hurricane with the eye wall here, the center of the storm at the left. And in this plane, air, of course, spirals into the boundary layer, goes up the eye wall, and so on. The colors are an indication, and this is actually, in this case, taken from a model simulation, but they're an indication of uh, the moist entropy of the system, that is the entropy of the combination of dry air, water vapor, and condensed water. It's an adiabatic invariant um, under uh, dis adiabatic displacements, including the phase change of water. The phase change of water by itself doesn't change the value of this quantity. It's like theta E for those of you who know that. As air spirals in, you can see that you're going from cold to warm colors, and that reflects the energetic process, which has been known for at least half a century, drives hurricanes as transfer of heat from the ocean, mostly in the form of evaporation of seawater. That's why they die when they go on land. Uh, one can put bounds on how much you can get or how fast the heat flows out of the ocean to the atmosphere. And this is a dr dramatic uh, illustration of this. This is essentially the same quantity. It's the moist entropy, but now it's from real data in a real hurricane, the center of which is at the center of the diagram. This is Hurricane Inez of 1966. This is the equivalent potential temperature whose log is the moist entropy of the system. And you can see this dramatic increase in the moist entropy just under the region of highest winds in the eye wall, reflecting again the enormous transfer of heat from the ocean to the atmosphere. That's what powers hurricanes. Knowing that, one can quantify things um, and talk about the an upper bound called the potential intensity, or V potential. Um, and in this case, that upper bound uh, includes the long-term energy balance of the upper ocean mix layer. We're not just expressing it in terms of sea surface temperature, but going back a step and asking what's controlling in the long-term sense the sea surface temperature. And you get essentially three factors. There's one uh, which you might think of as an efficiency uh, of conversion of thermal to mechanical energy. It's the ocean temperature minus the outflow temperature. This is essentially the temperature at the top of the hurricane and divided by this outflow temperature. Up here, we have the net radiative balance at the surface, the difference between incoming solar and outgoing infrared radiation, anything that affects uh, ocean mixed layer temperature from the point of view of ocean dynamics is included in this term here. And then we have, very importantly down here, the mean background trade wind speed that would appear in the bulk aerodynamic formula in the environment of the hurricane. When this is smaller, you can have more intense hurricanes. And the reason for that is if you have smaller mean winds, you have to maintain a greater evaporative potential between the ocean and the atmosphere to, to get the required heat out to balance the radiation. So when this becomes small, that becomes large. Now we, with some caveats, can go back through reanalysis data and actually calculate this potential intensity. It's very easy to calculate from real-time data. This is expressed here in meters per second, so you might think of this as an upper bound on wind speed, and this is for the main development region of the North Atlantic going back to 1949. There are difficulties here that have to do with the fact that there were all kinds of artificial trends introduced to the reanalysis data by, uh, for example, beginning to assimilate satellite data in the late 1970s, which we have tried to correct for here. But the important thing is that sort of well after all these discontinuities, uh, there has been an upward increase uh, starting in the early 1990s. It's actually gone up a whole 10%, which is a lot, and in particular a lot more than any of us expected based on you know, simple sort of global warming type scenarios. So something interesting has been going on in the tropical Atlantic the last 15 years or so, which we are trying to understand. But this is a whopping big increase. Part of that increase has to do with the fact that the outflow temperature, which in the potential intensity is really the temperature of the lower stratosphere, has been decreasing over this time too. So this is, again, the blue is the 100 millibar temperature from reanalysis data, basically. The green is an independent uh, assessment of that temperature from MSU satellite data. 
And you can also see in this the influence of two major volcanic eruptions. But for various reasons, which would be an interesting seminar in their own right, the temperature of the lower stratosphere has been declining. And this has been actually a major contributor to the increase in potential temperature. So in spite of the fact that we like to talk about relationships between tropical cyclones and sea surface temperature, sea surface temperature isn't really the, the thing that's controlling it. It co-varies with things that are controlling it, like, like um, radiation. And as it happens, this decline in lower stratospheric temperature, for very interesting reasons, is itself correlated with increasing sea surface temperature in the tropics. Um, so when we look at the potential intensity, which again is this black curve, this is actually the log of the potential intensity with its long-term mean removed, okay, we can break that down into these three contributions. The contribution from the efficiency factor in blue, again, it's, it's the log of that efficiency factor with a long-term mean removed. Uh, contributions from the surface radiative balance in green and contributions from varying trade wind speed in red. So when the wind speed's lower, uh, this red curve is higher. So the red, three colored curves sum up to that black curve. And you can see that the variations in all three of these factors are important contributors to the net variation in potential intensity. But the trends uh, in the last uh, couple of decades are mostly the cooling of the stratosphere, this blue curve, and the increasing radiative, uh, uh, net radiative input to the ocean in green, uh, which we think pro probably is a result of uh, anthropogenic global warming. Now, having, having looked at this potential intensity, the other factors which we think empirically and theoretically control hurricanes are, for example, wind shear and low-level environmental vorticity. And this is just trying to break down this po net power dissipation, again, where we've taken its log and removed the long-term mean into the three variations. These are the logs of these contributions to the uh, power dissipation. And you can see, once again, that all three the variability of all three are contributing to this uh, change in power dissipation. So it's not simple. Even though the SST correlation makes it look simple, it's not in the end of the day a simple uh, relationship. Now I want to talk a little bit about, now looking at the data is fine, and as some of you who are in the tropical cyclone community will very easily attest to, it's extremely controversial. There are all kinds of problems with the data, and there are all kinds of people throwing tomatoes around the room about this, which is good. I mean, we'll eventually try to do a bang-up job on the data analysis. It isn't the only approach. And um, there, are, there is modeling. And I want to spend a few minutes talking about sort of a new technique that's been developed over the last few years to downscale from global climate models to a hurricane climatology. Hur global climate models, with some interesting exception, very recent exceptions, don't have enough horizontal resolution really to capture hurricanes. I mean, they get hurricane-like phenomena, but not at their full intensity. You really have to be down in the few kilometer range to be numerically converged on intense hurricanes. So how do you deal with that? And the approach that we've taken is to, to uh, take the statistics of climate models to generate a very large synthetic tropical cyclone database that's consistent with that climate. And let me tell you how we do that. The first step is to generate a very large number of tracks, literal storm tracks, the centroids of the storms, in um, several different ocean basins to run an actual deterministic numerical model a coupled ocean atmosphere model, which is used, uh, among other things, to make real-time operational or quasi-operational uh, intensity predictions, and run that model along each of these order 10,000, sometimes 100,000 tracks. And then, having done that, to deduce from the resulting uh, wind uh, fields um, things like the wind risk at individual points of interest. So the synthetic track generation uh, starts off by um, simply drawing, and this is the only place that history come, hurricane history comes into this, we take the observed uh, genesis locations and form from that a probability distribution in space and time of uh, genesis, where hurricanes originate. We draw randomly from that uh, to, to, to initiate one of these synthetic tracks. And then we use a, a very old axiom that was for many years used to actually forecast hurricane movement, still being used as sort of a backup, uh, that is that the tropical cyclones tend to move with the large scale, the vertically averaged large scale wind in which they're embedded, plus a correction owing to the curvature of the Earth, so-called beta drift correction. 
Uh, it's an old tried and true technique, and it actually statistically works very well. And in this case, we're going to approximate this uh, vertical average by a simple average of two different levels in the atmosphere, 850 and 250 hectopascals. Now, the wind in term is itself derived from a synthetic time series, but a very constrained one. And so what we do is we, um, we take from NSEP reanalysis data, and then, as I'll show you later, also we can do this from global climate models. We calculate at these two different levels the monthly mean and the variances of these four wind components, two at each of the two levels, and also their covariances. And we construct synthetic wind time series. They're basically time Fourier series of random phase, but which are constrained to have the right or the observed mean, the right variances, the right covariances, and also a geostrophic turbulence power spectrum. The, the power of, the, of, the, uh, the, of the, uh, the power series goes off as the frequency cubed. Um, having done that, uh, we can then generate a very large number of synthetic wind fields which, are, which conform to data in these important respects. And this is just an example of, of 200 of a set of, in this case, 10,000 synthetic tracks generated by this method. And those of you who know something about tropical cyclones will say that they're somewhat realistic, although they continue far inland. That's fine because we have yet to run the intensity model. The intensity model is good enough to know about the difference between land and ocean and kill these storms when they move over land. But they do more or less the right thing. You can look at this not just by eyeball as we're doing now, but with more, more rigorously statistically, and they um, conform quite well to the statistics of historical tracks. Now, when we run the intensity model along each of these 10,000 tracks, we can compare uh, certain uh, robust statistics of, of those to statistics from the hurricane, historical hurricane database. And this is just the cumulative frequency distribution of the maximum storm lifetime maximum wind speed. So this can be read, this blue bar, for example, is the number of events per millennium uh, whose maximum wind speeds exceed 40 knots, about, about one per year, about 10 per year. So the blue is from 552 historical tracks since 1950, and the red is from this, from actually a mere 3,000 or so tracks from this technique. And you can see that these distributions are, are pretty similar to each other. You don't expect them to be exactly. There, there are, in fact, confidence bounds on these because they are limited samples. Um, now, the next step in this process is to do exactly the same thing. Uh, but using the uh, wind statistics as output from the global climate models. And there are a whole suite of these being run for the IPCC report, which is very soon to be released. And that provides the wind statistics needed to drive the tracks. It provides the thermodynamic state needed to drive the intensity model and the shear for the intensity model. What it does not provide, at least not in a way that we feel is terribly robust at the moment, the Genesis PDF. So in the exercise that I'm going to show you now, we've actually held that fixed, and that's an important limitation. So we don't allow the Genesis PDF to change with climate. Surely it does. All right. Uh, so you can think of this as being a partial uh, exercise in looking at the response of hurricanes to climate change. So I'm going to compare two different simulations from a set of IPCC models. The last 20 years of a run meant to simulate the last 100 years, the 20th century simulations, and years uh, 2180 through 2200 of a particular sort of middle-of-the-road IPCC scenario where carbon dioxide is stabilized at the end of this century at 720 parts per million. So it's a double of the current value of CO2. And this is kind of the bottom line, this one figure of this exercise. I could show you a lot more. Um, this is a bar graph for five, five of these climate models we've so far looked at. Uh, there are quite a few more we, we are planning to look at. And what you're seeing in this bar graph is the difference in percentage between what we call the landfall power dissipation. This is V cubed at landfall. It's actually a good estimate of the destructiveness of storms in human terms. Uh, between this, um, uh, this uh, 1AB scenario and the 20th century climate. And um, the blue bars are for the US mainland, uh, the green for the whole of the uh, land bordering the North Atlantic, uh, 
and the red for the land bordering the western North Pacific. So there's a lot of uh, differences between these models. The NCAR CCSM3, you have uh, uh, increases of over 70% um, in the US mainland, for example. That's very significant. Okay, it's a huge whopping increase in potential hurricane destruction. On the other hand, the Canadian climate model has very small increases. Uh, here's the GFDL model, and then there are two Japanese models here, which are all sort of intermediate and predict changes up to 40% or so. So this is a really, really big and potentially serious effect of climate change. If we start seeing, you know, 50, 60, 70% increases in potential destructiveness of tropical cyclones. But now I want to get to what I consider the real heart of, of this talk, and probably the most controversial part, um, which is the feedback of global tropical cyclone activity on the climate system. Now, there have been a number of very interesting talks at this meeting and at some uh, uh, recent meetings I've been to about the atmospheric effects of this. Uh, people like Bob Hart, who just talked this morning, had a very interesting talk about the effect of recurving tropical cyclones on poleward heat fluxes. Peter Webster, Kevin Trenberth, Greg Holland, and so on have all started to write uh, interesting um, papers on this subject. But I'm going to take a little different tack and look at the ocean side, which I think is, is in the long term, the really important thing. And I'm going to argue that it is through the effects of tropical cyclones on the upper ocean that we really begin to see uh, a profound uh, long-term effect on the climate system. Now, it's well known and has been well known for many decades that tropical cyclones very strongly cool the upper ocean. So here is a track of uh, Hurricane Emily through uh, the Yucatan, the Gulf of Mexico. And this is the sea surface temperature just after that uh, storm went by, and the scale's at the bottom here. So you can see that the Gulf, upper Gulf has cooled three and four degrees centigrade. Sometimes you see much larger numbers than that, five or six. Here's, by the way, the wake, uh, w the wake of Hurricane Dennis about a week earlier. All right? These leave a long, spectacular cold wakes. And it's also understood, the physics of this is understood very well. You might be tempted to think it's evaporation, and that is going on, that is cooling the ocean, but that explains perhaps a few tenths of this. The rest of it is mixing. And the way that works is pretty straightforward. So this is a typical temperature profile of the upper ocean from, say, 250 meters down to the surface. It uh, increases with, uh, as you go up in the ocean until you hit the base of the ocean mix layer at about 50 meters. And then you have this well mix layer. The hurricane comes by and mixes the water down to, oh, 200 meters or so, depending on how strong the hurricane is. That mixing conserves the heat of the column. You're actually not changing the heat content of the ocean. So you warm up this region between the old, between let's say 120 meters in this case and say 200 meters, the new uh, mixed layer depth, and you cool off the uh, upper part of the ocean here. Now, what happens, what's observed to happen over a period of two or three weeks, because this water is cold at the surface, you don't get as much flux to the atmosphere, and so the solar radiation is not being balanced, completely balanced by outgoing flux, and this reheats. So at the end of three weeks, at the end of the day, if you will, from the ocean's perspective, you're left with this big warm anomaly at depth. And, and statistically, the ocean has to balance this process. And thermodynamically, the only way it can do that is either by waiting for a cold season, the winter, to come so that it cools down generally and mixes down to this level. That can happen. Or by exporting this heat dynamically to a higher latitude where it can come in contact with a colder equilibrium temperature. Well, we know from dynamics that when you vigorously mix the upper ocean, you get a strong dynamical response. This is a kind of an idealized ocean model. It's the Princeton Ocean Model, in sort of a box you can think of as being like the North Atlantic. So there are boundaries here. And um, this is the response of the ocean to just mixing a single grid point uh, here in the mid-tropical, you can think of it as the tropical North Atlantic. And these are the currents at 700 meters depth. So you get strong current to the western boundary and then a strong poleward current. Okay. So it's um, fairly easy to go back and say, well, all right, if we have all these events going on around the world, how much of this kind of current, and how, and particularly how much heat flux, is being induced by tropical cyclones? Well, it turns out, and I guess I mentioned this at the bottom of this slide, 
that um, I, I tried to make an estimate back in 2001, and uh, I got about uh, globally an average rate of heat input to the ocean by tropical cyclones of about one and a half petawatts, 10 to the 15th watts. So that's a very large number. And it can be compared to measurements or inferences about the total poleward uh, heat flux by the ocean. And this is from a paper by Kevin Trenberth and colleagues uh, back about six years ago showing the total northward flux, zonally averaged, in the oceans as a function of latitude. And there's the Atlantic, there's the Pacific contribution, some measurements given by the asterisk here. But the point is it's of the order of a few petawatts. All right? So it's not easy to reject the hypothesis, uh, which admittedly is not very popular among oceanographers at the moment, that virtually the entire uh, THC heat flux, thermodynamic, the thermohaline circulation heat flux, uh, is powered by tropical cyclones. It's been known for 100 years that upper ocean mixing controls a large part of this heat flux. It's just not been, not been known what the agents of those mixing are. are. Now, it seems a little counterintuitive. I understand that. It's not easy to swallow this, but if you're interested, and I urge you to sit down and go through the argument seriously, because I'm serious about it, and a number of other people are starting to get serious about this. Um, and it's problematic because this effect is not in any current global coupled climate model, this, this potentially important piece of dynamics. Some other um, evidence in this favor, uh, David Raymond and colleagues ran an experiment in the Eastern Pacific, EPIC, uh, again, six years ago or so, where they tried to measure, uh, using very detailed techniques, mixing rates in the upper ocean. And this perhaps too much on the slide to read, but their conclusion in a nutshell was that on average, uh, the mixing uh, that goes on is far too small to explain what's needed from a variety of viewpoints by the ocean. In fact, in some places like here, around 50 meters, it's as small as its molecular value. I mean, you can't get smaller than that. Yet, when a, a, a simple convective storm, not a hurricane, just a thunderstorm came over, they got a huge amount of mixing. And so they concluded that it was these episodic events that were responsible for the upper ocean mixing in this part of the world. Uh, Matt Huber, Ron Shriver at uh, Purdue have uh, looked at ERA uh, analysis. They look at sea surface temperatures and they watch the wake recoveries as the cold wakes reheat and they also estimate things like the diffusivities that are associated with that process. This is just a map. Uh, showing the distribution, which not surprisingly looks like the distribution of tropical cyclones. And they also come to the conclusion that this is a terribly important part of the upper ocean's uh, heat budget that contributes to driving the poleward heat flux in the ocean. Um, other kinds of interesting discrepancies we see between observations and current climate models might be explained by this. So, I'm afraid that you have to be careful because these two graphs are not on the same vertical scale. This is the linear trend of the zonally integrated heat content of the world's oceans uh, by Sidney Levitas a few years ago. So it goes from 50 meters down to 1450 meters and from the South Pole to the North Pole. And you can see that that trend is mostly in the uh, subtropics and the tropics, but not in the equatorial regions, all right? Here is a particular coupled climate model exposed to a global warming scenario, it, what it does in terms of temperature trends. And you can see that by contrast, most of the, the, the temperature or heat content increase is occurring in the subpolar regions with very little penetration into the subtropics. This is, a, this is known amongst people who study these things. It's a big systematic error in the current generation of coupled models. And potentially, this can be explained by the fact that a lot of tropical cyclones occur in the tropics and subtropics, where they often reach peak intensity and are mixing heat down in those parts of the world. It's not in climate models. Now, um, several of us think that this uh, realization may also solve a number of long-standing climate riddles. One of my favorites being the riddle of the Eocene. The Eocene was a period beginning about 60 million years ago when the temperature was very high, high latitude, there was basically no ice on the earth, crocodiles wandering around Greenland and so on. I'm sure you've all heard about that. Uh, this is a paleo reconstruction of the sort of zonally average surface temperature in the Eocene. Um, 
up around uh, 12 or 13 or 14 degrees. Uh, I've even heard higher estimates since this was published in the polar regions and um, around 30 degrees in the tropics. This black curve references the present climate where it gets just below zero at the poles in the annual mean, the ocean temperature. Um, notice that it wasn't that much warmer in the tropics. Now, we, there are some higher estimates recently that might be up around 32 or so. It's very hard to get climate models, a couple of climate models, to behave this way. You can pump a lot of CO2 into them and make it as warm as you want, practically, in high latitudes, but then it's much too warm in the tropics. Well, we think that what's going on is that hurricanes, uh, if you try to warm the climate, become more active. Uh, they pump more heat to high latitudes, and therefore, thereby, they keep the tropics relatively cool, but at the expense of an accelerated warming of high latitudes. And Rob Cordy, who is my former student and who is now at Caltech, has started to look at this. And so uh, what he's done is to look at uh, a relatively simple uh, coupled climate model and performed two experiments, uh, both of, well, I should say, two pairs of experiments. In each pair, you go from the current climate to a really warm Eocene-like climate where you actually have 10 times CO2 in the atmosphere. And then he does another experiment, which is like that, but he replaces the constant diffusivity of the oceans model with a diffusivity that's related to a proxy for tropical cyclones. I mean, this model isn't simulating tropical cyclones. But that proxy is based on potential intensity, which you can calculate from these models. And this is the difference between the warming of those two experiments. So there's quite a bit less warming in the tropics when you put in the hurricane effect, and quite a bit more warming of the oceans at high latitudes, which is qualitatively what you expect. Now, the reason I think I'm giving this talk, I decided to talk about this, is I think that we are ignoring this perhaps at our peril right now. It's not in climate models. And it's not just a question of, well, maybe you know, if we make global warming projections or try to understand the EUC, we may be off by 10 or 20 percent. And the problem is that because this ocean mixing, which is so fundamental to driving the ocean, and which in today is basically a fixed number in climate models, uh, in this concept is strongly a function of the climate state itself. If it's related to tropical cyclones, tropical cyclones change with climate. Yes, there's arguments about how much and so on, but there's not much argument that they change. Uh, and so the dynamic of the system is different from the dynamics of the system as we currently conceive them. And I've tried to explore this a few years ago with a very simple uh, Cli a really simple climate model. Basically, you have two columns, a tropical column and a polar column, and you have parameterized atmospheric heat flux and so on, but pretty good job with vertical transfers by radiation and convection. And in this case, we have an ocean diffusivity, which is driven or coupled to a proxy for hurricanes. And this, is, uh, this model actually produces, because it's so simple, actual steady states, uh, and not just statistical ones. And what you're seeing here is the steady state temperature of the tropical box as a function of some measure of the climate forcing. You can think of this as sunlight or CO2 in a model this simple. There's not much difference between those two. And as you increase the forcing, the temperature does go up, as you would expect, but you actually get multiple equilibria. Uh, so if you actually were to do this slowly, it would go up to here and then jump to this new state and go up to here, and if you kept warming it up, it would finally jump to a third state. And if you reverse the process, you get hysteresis. It would come down to here and then jump down to there. So you get this sort of jumpy, uh, kind of quantized climate. And um, what you do, if you look at the model, you find that this cold state, okay, uh, has basically no ocean heat flux at all. It's all by the atmosphere. This green state, sort of the Goldilocks scenario, where it's sort of just right, you have the flux by the, both the ocean and the atmosphere, about the same magnitude. In this state here, almost all the flux is by the ocean. All right. Now, I'm not trying to advertise this as some sort of correct realization of the climate. You can't make a conclusion like that on such a simple model. But if you take this interactive ocean mixing out of this model, you don't get this behavior. Okay, you just get a nice sort of curve, one single curve on this diagram. And this is what I mean by the fact that the dynamics change. It's not just crossing the T's and dotting the I's. You get a different system dynamic if you put this effect into the ocean. 
So that's a little scary. Are we going to push our system over this cliff into a new state? Is our future going to look like this? This is a uh, artist depiction of what Central North America looked like during the early Eocene about 60 million years ago. Um, these are the sorts of things that in a number of different contexts keep climate scientists awake at night. It's not the one degree, two degree change or the little bit of rise of sea level. We can adjust to those things. It's jumps, all right? And if we, we know such jumps have occurred in the past beyond much doubt from the paleo record, we don't understand that. We had better well, we'd better jolly well get a hold of this system dynamic so we're in a position to understand if jumps are going to be part of our future. Uh, tropical cyclones, just to summarize, the tropical cyclones are sensitive to the climate state. We know that. I think that's beyond dispute. Uh, we can dispute what's causing the climate to change or exactly how and why it's sensitive, but they do change. It's been known for a long time. Observations... Uh, suggest and modeling are consistent with about 10% increase in potential intensity. All other things being equal give about a 65% increase in this um, in um, uh, power dissipation by tropical cyclones. Um, Storm-induced mixing of the upper tropical ocean may be uh, the principal driver of the ocean's thermohaline circulation, certainly an important contributor to it, or right, whatever else might be going on. Uh, increased power dissipation by tropical cyclones in a warmer climate, in principle, will drive a larger poleward heat flux in the ocean. This would temper the tropical warming. So if this is really important, for example, I would argue that the present class of climate models is over-predicting tropical warming um, in a global warming scenario. But at the same time, it amplifies the warming at high latitudes. It exports that heat to high latitudes. So if this is correct, maybe we're under-predicting a high latitude temperature change. Um, and the final important point, which I just want to reiterate here, is that this effect is not in current climate models. It's not, it's not that it's underrepresented, uh, but it's not represented. It's just not there for all practical purposes. And its inclusion, which I hope we'll see happen in the next decade or so, uh, may change our understanding of climate dynamics for a whole variety of problems, and as well as uh, things like predictions of how the Earth might respond to uh, increased greenhouse gases. And I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you. So I'm going to repeat. I'm not sure everyone heard the question. So Doug Lilly asked, um, can't we really do a bang-up job observing these cold waves and watching them recover? And that can and should be done. And in fact, it is being done. For example, Tom Sanford at the University of Washington has employed these really ingenious uh, floats that go down and take measurements. And they're little robots, basically, and come back up to survey the wakes of hurricanes observed during the, the Navy's uh, sea blast experiment a few years ago and seen mixing down to quite large depths. Jim Price has done a lot of interesting work on this as well. So, um, and, and of course, there are all kinds of different approaches, even using the reanalysis data, at least you're watching the surface recover. But you can infer, if you knew the stratification and you know how cold it is, you could sort of infer how deep the mixing had to be, at least within some uh, you know, order of magnitude, factor of two, something like that. And that's what Matt Huber has been doing. So I think you'll see exactly what you suggest start to happen more and more. I apologize for my ignorance, but um, the, I just learned a lot from you. And uh, one thing that comes to my mind is that there are recent suggestions to start pumping the aerosols in the stratosphere to... Uh, uh, prevent further global warming f due to the increase of the um, greenhouse gases. So what is your comment on how would that affect the hurricanes, taking into account that basically the hurricane intensity is, is driven by the cooling of the stratosphere? Thanks. Okay. So I, I think everyone must have heard that question. It's an excellent question. Um, this is controversial, but Mike Mann and I believe that the, the minimum of Atlantic hurricane activity that we saw in the 70s and 80s was largely explainable by the fact that the ocean temperatures were lower then. And indeed, the, the entire northern hemisphere was anomalously cool in that period. Um, 
and although there are several contributing factors to it, most people who look at this and try to model it have come to the conclusion that sulfate aerosols, in this case tropospheric and man-made, were a, a large contributor to that. So if that's the only evidence I had to go on, I would say that potentially cooling the planet with, with sulfate aerosols or however you want to do it would have an effect. I'm not saying I advocate that. I haven't thought through that. I'm not at all expert in that. But if you're simply asking the narrow question, would it affect hurricanes, I would say, from what, we, from what evidence we have, probably. Well, it's a delightful presentation uh, to give us uh, very much to think about. And one of the key things I think you brought out was the fact that that interface is not well handled in any of the models in particular. That is, the transition of a sea state from essentially more or less smooth to very disturbed wave state in which you change from viscous to pressure stresses acting on the nonlinearity of waves. And I don't think any models probably still capture that right, even weather models to some extent, but certainly not the climate models. One of the things uh, that was most interesting, of course, was this uh, bifurcation of the ocean atmosphere heat transport when you put this in. That must have uh, actually have an impact on the conveyor belt too, though. So I, you know, how have you interacted or interfaced these uh, aspects that that would change the conveyor belt circulation in oh, sure. a large system like that? That's right. And so that little simple two-box model which shows us hysteresis is much too simple to draw firm conclusions from. Um, it does suggest an avenue of research, though, that I hope people will take up. I don't feel I'm in a position to do uh, that. I stay away from big models. I, I don't feel I have that. I don't, I'm not courageous enough to run them, but I admire the people who do. I'd like to see that exactly that sort of thing looked at. The, the, okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm only asking another question because no one else is. <laughs> um, your, your hypothesis about how the tropical cyclones impact the ocean circulation is, uh, is a very interesting one and seems to make a lot of sense with what we see with the observations, as you pointed out. But if it's the case, and it's not in a couple GCMs looking at how climate changes, it, wouldn't that act as a negative feedback on the thermodynamic changes to the hurricanes absolutely so that the potential intensity increases we're looking at if your hypothesis is right would not be as great exactly so chris says that these for example these changes all right are produced by cl couple climate models which are missing precisely the effect of the feedback on this and what you'd expect that to do qualitatively is to lower these uh, numbers because you're lowering the potential intensity etc of the tropics now of course you can't eliminate them because it's just a feedback, but you can lower them that way. And I would expect them to be lower. Yes. Uh, Chuck Hackerine, and then I'll yeah. ask a question that would have been asked to me by my children about 10 or 15 years ago. Um, if you look at your plots of synthetic storm tracks in the Pacific and in Indian Ocean, they generally move in a straight line east to west. But in the Atlantic, the vast majority of them curve to follow the coastline of the eastern United States. So the question my child asks, do they curve because the coastline is there, or is the shape of the coastline been determined by the movement of those <laughs> hurricane tracks over thousands of years to pound the uh, land surface into that shape? I wish I had students who asked questions like that. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I sort of seriously doubt that hurricanes have that dramatic effect on, on the bulk coastline, but it's clear that they affect, you know, in detail coastal structure. They create inlets, they wash away sand. And, you know, there, there are questions like the ones that, that you just talked about that have been asked in other contexts and thought to be crazy originally and then something to it. So, for example... Uh, topo topography and the evolution of topography of the Earth. You know, it's, it's well known that mountain ranges affect weather, affect rainfall, and so on. But the whole evolution of mountains is, it turns out, to be strongly affected by the asymmetries of erosion between the up, 
the windward side where the rain falls and so on. And this is being looked at very seriously now. The particular question you asked, I don't, I've never heard asked before, uh, but uh, it's worth thinking about things. It's worth going out on limbs and thinking seriously about questions like that. I think that's how you learn the most from, from uh, looking at systems like this. Thanks for talking about the Eocene, which we don't uh, hear enough about. It's a, a very troubling uh, puzzle. And I, my question really is, um, recognizing that you don't run coupled ocean atmosphere models for the Eocene uh, yourself, but just uh, what's, what's your intuitive sense in an Eocene world with much increased ocean heat transport, what the share of that, uh, what share of that is due to increased hurricane activity versus wind-driven ocean circulation changes versus thermohaline. And in particular, uh, would you envision a large latitudinal shift in the extent of, of hurricane activity? Um, so, so yes, I think in a climate that extreme, one would certainly expect large geographical shifts and poleward shifts in hurricane activity. Um, it's a challenge, for example, to take a model and then maybe try to force it into an Eocene state and try to do some of this downscaling I've been talking about to, to see what, of course, you'd have to, to deal with this genesis issue too, but to try to see what the hurricane climatology would be. I, let me say in response to the first part of your question that the hypothesis is that, the, of course, the general warming is produced by something else, maybe carbon dioxide, for example, some, some other agent, but that the hurricanes are being invoked to drive an exceptionally strong thermohaline circulation in the ocean, which would produce a much more equable climate, that is, a cooler tropics and a warmer high latitudes. Um, well, that, the, the Pacific especially, because at least today that's where most of the tropical cyclones occur. The, the question is, to what extent is that a testable hypothesis? Um, it's all very well to come up with fanciful theories like that. You could try to model them. It's not entirely hopeless that we could at least, for example, uh, examine the question of whether there were more or fewer hurricanes in that era and whether they might have been more intense or not. I talked about paleotempestology, and I talked about a particular technique which certainly couldn't be pushed back that far. But there are other techniques involving bottom sediments, involving oxygen isotope ratios in, um, in cave deposits, for example, that could get you back further in time. I don't know how far, uh, but I think... You know, I haven't given up hope that we might actually be able to discover certain things, test parts of that hypothesis. I think that we probably ought to cut things off at this point. Uh, and thank Kerry again for a thought-provoking talk. What about... Uh,